Let's talk about Targeted Temperature Management, TTM, after cardiac arrest. First, we will review indications for TTM after cardiac arrest with ROSC. Then, we will review the three phases of TTM. In doing so, we will describe the results of the landmark TTM trial, and finally, we will identify potential complications of TTM. First, let's review indications for TTM. All patients with a Glasgow Coma Scale of less than 8 after ROSC should receive targeted temperature management. Essentially, if the patient is not showing purposeful movement and or unresponsive to verbal commands, or could reasonably be considered comatose, they should be considered for TTM. Does the arrest rhythm matter? While trials historically included a higher proportion of patients post-shockable rhythm arrest, meaning ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, we now have data demonstrating improved outcomes with TTM after non-shockable rhythm arrest, PEA, and asystole. The Hyperion trial from 2019 demonstrated improved survival with a favorable neurologic outcome at 90 days with TTM at 33 degrees after arrest with a non-shockable rhythm, 10.2% versus 5.7%. Therefore, the answer is no. Post-arrest patients with shockable and non-shockable rhythm should receive TTM. Does arrest location matter? Again, no. Both out-of-hospital and in-hospital arrest should be considered for TTM if ROSC is obtained. Note, hemodynamic instability is not a contraindication to TTM as long as the patient is on stable doses of vasopressors and inotropes. Our ultimate goal with targeted temperature management is to prevent or decrease post-cardiac arrest brain injury from hypoxia and ischemia. In most clinical trials, this is defined as a favorable neurologic outcome on either the Cerebral Performance Category, CPC, or the Modified Rankin Scale. Favorable by both metrics typically means the ability to live independently with minimal assistance. Does TTM accomplish this goal? Yes. In addition to the previously discussed Hyperion trial, two landmark trials from 2002 comparing TTM to normothermia by Bernard et al., and the hypothermia after cardiac arrest study group demonstrated improved outcomes with TTM compared to normothermia, 49% versus 26% by Bernard et al., and 55% versus 39% by the HACA study group. This equates to a number needed to treat of 6 to 7 to prevent one unfavorable neurologic outcome or death. After the decision is made to initiate TTM, the patient will move through three phases induction or cooling, maintenance, and rewarming. First, let's discuss the induction phase. The patient should be cooled to the goal temperature as rapidly as possible. Of note, after cardiac arrest and ROSC, many patients will present with a temperature less than 36 degrees Celsius due to mixing of cool peripheral blood with warmer core blood. There are two major methods for cooling, external or surface cooling, and intravascular. In our hospital system, the external cooling system is also referred to by the brand name Arctic Sun. The intravascular cooling system may be referred to by the manufacturer title, Zoll. External cooling devices typically utilize gel pads, while intravascular devices infuse cold fluids in a closed loop system. The intravascular device typically has three additional lumens that can be utilized for other infusions if needed. Both devices are connected to a terminal that provides continuous temperature feedback to achieve the set target temperature. How do these two methods differ? In an analysis of the TTH48 trial, intravascular cooling devices were associated with a shorter time to target temperature, 2.2 versus 4.2 hours, as well as decreased temperature variability and rewarming rate. There was no difference in mortality or neurologic outcomes. After induction, we enter the maintenance phase. What should our target temperature be, and how long should we keep patients at that temperature? To answer this question, let's review the landmark TTM trial by Nielsen et al. from 2013. The TTM trial was a large multicenter RCT across 36 ICUs in Europe and Australia, comparing TTM at 33 degrees versus 36 degrees Celsius. In the TTM trial protocol, patients were cooled to the target temperature, maintained a target temperature for 28 hours, and then gradually rewarmed to 37 degrees Celsius and 0.5 degrees Celsius increments, with the goal of maintaining a temperature less than 37.5 for at least 72 hours. 
Main inclusion criteria were GCS less than 8 after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with greater than 20 minutes of spontaneous circulation after ROSC. What did these arrests look like? 90% were witnessed, 73% received bystander CPR with a median time of 1 minute until BLS, 9 to 10 minutes until ACLS, and 25 minutes until ROSC. Approximately 80% were shockable rhythms. At the end of the trial, an approximate three-year period, there was no significant difference in mortality or poor neurologic function at 180 days between the 33 and 36 degree groups. There was no difference in rates of shivering, fever, or adverse outcomes between groups, with the exception of slightly more hypokalemia in the 33 degree group. The authors concluded that TTM at 33 degrees does not confer additional benefit compared to 36 degrees. Next. The TTH48 trial compared TTM at 33 degrees for 48 versus 24 hours. There was no difference in favorable neurologic outcomes at 6 months, with a higher rate of adverse events and longer ICU length of stay in the 48 hour group. The decision to target 33 or 36 degrees is institution dependent. Why might 33 degrees Celsius be preferred? A retrospective cohort study from 2012 assessing 1,200 cardiac arrest patients over an 18 year period found a maximum benefit of TTM at 33 degrees with respect to favorable neurologic outcome and survival in patients with no flow time, or time from collapse to initiation of CPR, of greater than 8 minutes. Notably, this finding was not replicated in a post hoc analysis of the TTM trial. To recap, patients should be maintained at the target temperature for 24 hours, with some evidence to indicate that 33 degrees Celsius may be preferred for patients with longer no-flow times. What complications of TTM should we be aware of? Shivering is the most common human response to hypothermia and slows the rate of cooling. First line to control shivering is adequate analgesia and sedation. Fentanyl is a first-line agent for analgesia. Sedation can be achieved with propofol, dexmedetomidine, or midazolam. If unable to control shivering with sedative and analgesic infusions, neuromuscular blockade can be utilized. Adjunctive agents include acetaminophen and buspirone. Arrhythmia is also common. AFib occurred in 26 to 28 percent of patients in the TTM trial. VT occurred in 15 to 18 percent and bradycardia in 5-6% of patients. Hypothermia causes a cold-induced diuresis, which can lead to hypovolemia as well as numerous electrolyte abnormalities, including hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypocalcemia. Hypothermia decreases insulin sensitivity and secretion leading to hyperglycemia. Control of hyperglycemia may require initiation of an insulin infusion. Hypothermia impairs coagulation and platelet function and increases the risk of bleeding. Coagulopathy and or active bleeding may be a contraindication to TTM and risk versus benefit must be considered in these situations. Finally, hypothermia impairs immune system function and increases the risk of infection. Approximately 50% of patients in the TTM trial developed pneumonia. A 2019 placebo-controlled RCT demonstrated that a two-day course of IV amoxicillin clavulanate after cardiac arrest decreased the incidence of early ventilator-associated pneumonia, defined as the first seven days of hospitalization. IV ampicillin sulbactam, or another similar antibiotic, can be utilized. After the maintenance period, the patient is rewarmed to 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. Rewarming should occur at a rate of 0.2 to 0.5 degrees Celsius per hour. It is critical during the rewarming period to avoid rebound fever. Therefore, patients should be locked in at a temperature between 36 to 37 degrees utilizing the feedback system of the external or intravascular cooling device. Neurologic prognostication with the assistance of a neurologist or neurocritical care specialist can typically begin as early as 72 hours after the arrest. Prognostication includes consideration of the clinical exam, including motor response to pain, pupillary, and corneal reflexes, imaging, including CT, MRI, and EEG, 
and biomarkers, including neuron-specific enolase, a protein released from injured neurons. In this video, we reviewed indications for targeted temperature management after cardiac arrest with ROSC and identified that all comatose patients should be considered for TTM regardless of etiology or location of arrest. We then reviewed the three phases of TTM, induction, maintenance, and rewarming, during which we described the results of the landmark TTM trial which found no difference in outcome between TTM at 33 versus 36 degrees. Finally, we reviewed potential complications of TTM, including shivering, arrhythmia, cold-induced diuresis, hyperglycemia, bleeding, and increased risk of infection. Thank you for watching.